Well, good afternoon or good morning, but happy new year to everyone, wherever you are. Thanks for joining us and welcome to today's webcast on understanding CAP surveys, a primer for new users. We're delighted to have so many of you join us, um, both who are brand new to, to CAPS and those of you who will view this as kind of a refresher course. Uh, my name is Dale Schaller. I will be moderating uh, the whole session today, which is presented by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Qualities, or HRQ's CAPS User Network. Next slide. Just wanna quickly go through a few housekeeping issues. Um, the first relates to if you're having any trouble with audio, you can go to the microphone icon at the lower left of your screen and you can open that up and you can find a way to um, have the connection made by a phone call or have Zoom call you back. Sometimes people have difficulty with a poor connection and one way to solve that is to log off and log back in. To ask a question today, which we encourage all of you to do, you use the Q&A icon, which is located right next to the raise hand icon, again, at the bottom of your menu. Um, you just enter your question and then send it off. We ask if you are willing to provide your name and organization that helps us understand where you're coming from and, and how to contextualize your question. Um, please note that both the um, raise hand feature and the chat function for your connection to Zoom are not um, operating today for you. So everything will go through Q&A and that's how we'll handle all the questions. Finally, this comes up a lot. The slides uh, for today's webcast are available. They're available already. Uh, they're on what we call the event website. You can see the URL here, which is https colon forward slash forward slash events, E-V-E-N-T-S dot west at dot com forward slash caps forward slash. Um, you can get to the slides, you can view the agenda and also access speaker bios on the event slide or the event um, site, uh, which will be available until next Wednesday, the 18th of January. But I will let you know that a full replay of today's webcast will be available down the line in a few weeks on the CAPS website. And I'll tell you about the URL for that at the end of um, our session today. So moving on to our agenda, uh, we'll begin with an overview of ARC's CAPS program, and then dive into um, basics of what we do with the, the CAPS program that will include key design principles, examples of survey measures, sampling and administration methods, and various ways in which the CAPS survey results can be used. We'll then wrap up with a review of some of our recent program highlights. And uh, we always try to leave plenty of time for your questions so that we can answer them as, as much as possible. Next slide, please. So our speakers today will be led off by Karen Ginsberg. Uh, welcome, Karen. She directs the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality's CAPS program, as well as the Surveys on Patient Safety Culture, or SOPS program all within the Center for Quality Improvement and Patient Safety at AHRQ. Joining Karen is Stephanie Fry, who is a Senior Study Director at Westat. Welcome, Stephanie. Westat's a research organization that is based in Rockville, Maryland, that serves as the prime contractor to AHRQ for supporting both the CAPS and the SOPS programs. And again, my name is Dale Schaller. I've been a longtime member of the CAPS Consortium serving as your moderator today. Again, more bio information is available on the event page. And I'm very pleased to now turn things over to you, Karen. Thanks so much, Dale. And welcome, everyone. Uh, and Happy New Year. We're so pleased that you're able to attend today's uh, CAPS 101. It's an annual offering. Uh, for new users who want to learn about the program and also for more experienced users, there's always information that will be new to you that we present. So we're happy that you've joined us again. And um, again, welcome to, to everyone. I'd like to, can I have the, for the next slide, please? I'd like to first review a little bit about the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, which has sponsored CAPS 
for uh, uh, for a long time, and a little bit about what our agency does and how the CAPS program fits into our agency's mission. Uh, we talk about our core competencies at ARC. We're a science-based agency, and as such, we invest in research and evidence to make healthcare safer and improve quality. We create tools for healthcare professionals to use to improve care for their patients. And we generate measures and data to so we can track the performance of the US healthcare system and evaluate its, its, um, its progress. And another important feature of what we do is, is make sure that our tools and our, uh, are available to you, our users. So we, we focus on pushing our science to implementation. And the next slide, please. So as you know, CAP stands for Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers and Systems, and the CAPS program is uh, advances the understanding and the measurement and improvement of patients' experiences with their healthcare. As I've mentioned, we've been around for a long time, since 1995, continuously funded by ARC, and uh, you'll hear about the CAPS consortium uh, if you stay involved with us, uh, which consists of um, our funded uh, cooperative agreements, uh, Yale University, the RAND Corporation, our contractor, Westat, and ARC staff. And together we comprise the CAPS consortium and we oversee the, the technical quality of the work that the CAPS program does. I want to um, just let you know that, you know, as a science-based agency, ARC doesn't have a mandate, uh, is not able to mandate the use of any of the CAPS surveys. And and many of you administer CAP surveys to meet some programmatic requirements. They don't come from ARC. They come from other organizations. So uh, just so that you more fully understand ARC's space in the CAPS world, where we do research and development, we don't require the use of any of our tools. Uh, on the next slide, please. So the CAP surveys are the gold standard for patient experience measurement, and that's because they're, they are, are recognized as such because they capture the patient's voice in, in many stages of the survey development process. Uh, the surveys measure patient experience in different healthcare settings and with health plans and providers. And when we develop these surveys, and you're gonna hear more about this today, uh, they're developed using a standardized methodology and research findings. And I just want to uh, point out that CAPS is a registered a trademark of the Department of Health and Human Services. And in order to uh, use the CAPS trademark to call a survey CAPS, the, the survey has to meet our design principles and adhere to our design principles and to meet our standards for testing. On the next slide, please. Um, so briefly, our program focus is to um, conduct research and develop tools to understand patient experience of care, uh, focus on how to measure it, uh, collect data, how to collect the data, how to report patient experience data, and to how to improve quality based on CAP survey results. Uh, and the next slide. Um, here, I'm going to go into more detail when I sum up our accomplishments at the end of the, uh, for the last five years at the end of this webcast. But just on the high level, here are some of the things that we've been interested in recently. Patients' experience with shared decision-making and patient engagement, and patient safety, uh, collecting experience data using narrative protocols or open-ended questions that accompany the short answer CAP surveys, um, uh, effectiveness of different survey administration modes for collecting CAPS data. We spent in the past couple of years, a lot of time focusing on patient experience with telehealth and assessing racial and ethnic disparities in patient experience. So with that, I'm going to turn the floor to Stephanie to uh, for the next segment of our webcast. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Karen. Um, and let's jump right into our CAPS 101 then. Next slide, please. So starting right at the beginning, the CAPS program defines patient experience as the range of interactions that patients have with the healthcare system including healthcare from health plans, from doctors, nurses, staff in hospitals, physician practices, and other healthcare facilities. As an integral component of healthcare quality, patient experience includes several aspects of healthcare delivery that patients highly value when they seek and receive care, such as getting timely appointments, easy access to information, good communication with healthcare providers, and so on. 
you can see that this definition touches on the patient experience measures that are derived from the CAP survey. Next slide, please. I think it's important to pause and talk a little bit about the difference between patient experience and patient satisfaction. How are they different? The terms often get used interchangeably, but they're really quite different things. To assess patient experience, you have to find out from patients whether something that should have happened in a healthcare setting actually did happen or how often it happened. Uh, that would be something like clear communication with a provider. Satisfaction, on the other hand, is more about whether a patient's expectation about an encounter were met. Two people who receive the exact same care, for example, but have different expectations could have different reports on their satisfaction because their expectations fundamentally were different. Some elements of satisfaction can also include uh, satisfaction with things like amenities, parking, food, and so on. That's not the gist of patient experience, and CAPS surveys really focus strictly on measuring patient experience. Next slide, please. Now that you know a little bit about what patient experience is, why do we measure it? Why is it important? In short, extensive evidence suggests that there is a strong relationship between patient experience and other important outcomes. So we've got a couple of different categories of outcomes here. On the healthcare outcomes side, there has been evidence to link strong positive patient experience with patient adherence, process of care measures, clinical outcomes, in fact, and patient safety. Those are very much related to the business outcomes as well, where, again, strong patient experience has been shown to reduce mal malpractice risk, improve employee satisfaction, and improve financial performance. Next slide. CAPS surveys and administration guidelines are developed using research and evidence. And this is what Karen talked about in terms of ARC being a research agency. CAPS surveys are designed to focus on what patients think is important about healthcare. It's what they need to know and want to know as consumers of healthcare. To ensure that CAPS surveys do indeed reflect patient focus, there's a standardized development process that includes conducting focus groups with patients, drafting survey domains and questions, cognitively testing those drafts with patients and ensuring that patients and consumers are involved in the development at each step. Stakeholder and user input are incorporated at the initial development stage, but also on an ongoing basis thereafter as the CAPS consortium revises surveys as needed to stay in sync with the changing landscape of healthcare delivery. For example, we leverage stakeholder technical expert panel, solicit input through public comments or RFIs, collect feedback after surveys are released and regularly collaborate with partners to test new content and new methodologies. The CAPS Consortium conducts ongoing research into best practices to support all aspects of sampling, data collection, modes of administration, analysis, and reporting of patient experience of care. Prior to releasing any survey, there is extensive field testing Field testing results are analyzed to assess representativeness and reliability of data. Testing is often conducted iteratively with multiple rounds to ensure that changes implemented are achieving the intended effect. Documentation to support users of CAPS surveys highlight the importance of standardization, that is collecting, analyzing, and reporting data in a standardized fashion, which will allow for data to be compared over time. For example, if you wanted to know if your scores have changed since the last time you administered the CAPS survey. And it also allow, allows for comparison to other entities or practices or plans or regions. And we'll talk a little bit more about this when we talk about the CAPS database. Uh, we've mentioned it before, but it bears repeating that all CAPS surveys and tools are in the public domain and available for use free of charge. Next slide. This slide shows um, some examples of CAPS core surveys. CAPS surveys ask about patient experience with providers, such as medical groups and practice sites. These are the surveys shown in the upper left quadrant. Other CAPS surveys ask about patient experience with care delivered in facilities, including hospitals, dialysis centers, and nursing homes. That's your upper right quadrant. And there are also CAPS surveys 
that ask enrollees about their experience with health plans and related programs, and ask about patient experience with care for specific healthcare conditions. All of these surveys and related documentation are available on the ARC CAPS website, or we have links to the various places where you can access these various surveys and data. Next slide, please. Given the focus on the aspects of care that are important to patients, many CAPS surveys come cover similar topic areas. Here you see just two examples of CAPS surveys and the measures that make them up. Um, so within each survey, the domains are tailored to fit the specific facility or type of interaction, type of care being delivered. Here are the domains covered by the clinician and group survey, as well as the hospital survey or HCAP survey, as many of you know it. You'll note that there are many crosswalking domains like communication, access or responsiveness, and overall ratings. These are the things that patients have expressed are truly important to them. Uh, it bears repeating that CAPS measures can change over time. Concepts and specific items are updated as needed to reflect practice standards or changes in the healthcare landscape in general. Next slide, please. Users of CAPS surveys can incorporate additional questions known as supplemental items to create a customized CAPS survey that meets their needs. If you're fielding a survey that you're going to call a CAP survey or that you want to submit data to a database, you must begin with a CAPS core questionnaire. You can add questions or individual survey items to that to collect data on other topics that are important to you. Next slide, please. Here are just a couple of examples of some CAPS supplemental items. There are many CAPS developed supplemental items that address common topics of interest. For example, shared decision making, health literacy, use and effectiveness of health information technology, communication items designed for an in depth look at performance. These are the kinds of things that might support quality improvement efforts. Narrative items, which is what Karen mentioned earlier, or open ended uh, items to get feedback from respondents, and many others. The CAPS supplemental items are available on the ARC CAPS website through a searchable database. And if there are no CAPS questions covering the topic of particular interest to you, you can also add your own user specific questions. These type of questions would be added at the end of the CAPS survey. Next slide, please. Now that we've covered some of the basic concepts about what a CAPS survey is, let's move into an overview of the discussion of how you could administer the survey and how you may want to use the resulting data. Uh, again, to reiterate what Karen mentioned at the beginning of this session, ARC does not require the implementation of any CAPS surveys. However, ARC provides information about how to administer CAPS surveys to help users identify the approaches that best meet their own specific needs. Information to support users is based on testing and methodological research conducted regularly by the CAPS consortium. Next slide, please. Uh, the CAPS Consortium conducts extensive testing to support users in deciding how many surveys they will need to field in order to answer their research question. We conduct testing to assess level of reliability and validity of CAPS items and measures based on the number of completed surveys you would need. Sampling is a way to get at a representative portion of your population so that you don't have to try to collect data from every single member. The specifics of sampling will vary by survey and also by your intended goal for the data collection and reporting. When considering the sample size required, it can be helpful to walk back from your ultimate reporting goal. For example, if you are fielding the CAPS clinician and group survey, your goal could be public reporting of scores for an ambulatory practice, or it could be quite different. Maybe you're looking for internal quality improvement for a medical group and data to support QI initiatives. For other surveys, there are also decisions to make about the level of reporting you're planning to do and about your goals, be they public reporting or more internal review. The next thing to consider is how you're going to collect your data. This is important as your data collection methodology will impact the number of people who are likely to respond. For example, 
if you mail a single survey to your sample, you may get 15 or 20% returned, maybe less these days. Uh, whereas if you also mail a reminder and then a non-response follow-up survey and then follow up after that with a telephone call to people who haven't returned your survey, you may get something much higher, maybe 35 or 40% returned. And I will note that response rates are going to vary dramatically based on uh, the kind of information you have to contact your patient population, the type of pa patient population being surveyed, saliency, and more. But stepping back, you can either use historical data from prior data collections, or in speaking to other organizations like yours, make an educated guess about what's your data collection strategy and what do you anticipate your response rate is likely to be? So if you think you need 300 completed surveys for your proposed data use and reporting, and you use a methodology that you think will yield, let's say a 40% response rate, you're going all in, um, then you can calculate that your starting sample should be 750 patients. Next slide, please. There are many ways to deliver a survey and to announce to respondents that they will be rece receiving a survey. Common modes for administering CAP surveys include mail, telephone, electronic or web-based, and a mixed mode, including two or more of those approaches. ARC and the CAPS Consortium have devoted considerable effort to research on the issue and tested the modes that you see on the screen and many others, including in-office, um, interactive voice response, and text messaging. Results from recent testing suggest that in general, mail, telephone, and mixed mode, which would be mail with phone follow-up or electronic notification of a web survey with mail or telephone follow-up, result in higher response rates for CAPS surveys. Importantly, I would note that when electronic or web-based data collection has been used on its own, not as part of a mixed mode, that data collection approach consistently produces the lowest response rates. Choosing an appropriate method for survey administration that maximizes your response rates and provides a sample of respondents that represents your population is complicated and highly nuanced. As healthcare delivery evolves and technology changes um, and communication modality changes, the CAPS Consortium continues to test different modes of administration to identify those that are most successful in reaching the target population and producing valid and comparable data. We also recognize that some strategies can better reach individual segments of a population than other strategies. And we're continuing to do research in this area and provide that out with documentation to users. Next slide, please. With your sample drawn and your data collection completed, what next? Um, ARC provides a range of tools to help you with your analysis. The goal of analysis is to prepare for reporting. All CAPS surveys include composite measures, which are groups of questions that together assess patient experience in a particular area. For example, communication with a healthcare provider, there's one overarching domain, but it's made up of several individual questions. Through analysis, you combine data for each of the questions and calculate a composite score. Typically, individual items are less reliable than multiple item combinations getting at that broad domain. If you're looking to compare your results to the results of others um, during the analytic phase, it's also important to conduct case mix adjustment. Case mix adjusts for characteristics about survey respondents like age, education, and health status. Conducting case mix adjustment makes it more likely that differences seen in reported outcomes are the result of actual differences rather than differences in the type of patients seeking care from particular providers. Case mix adjustment is a way really to level the playing field. To help with these analyses, the CAPS Consortium makes available a SAS macro to support compos composite measure calculation and case mix adjustment. The SAS macro, along with other users support documentation, is available on the CAPS website. Next slide, please. 
depending on which CAPS survey you're using, you may also want to choose to participate in the CAPS database and obtain comparative data. Currently, the CAPS database includes active data collection and reporting for the CAPS health plan survey. And this includes both adult and child versions for commercial, Medicaid, and CHIP. We also have a CAPS database for the Home and Community-Based Services Survey, or HCBS, and for Child HCAPS, or Hospital CAPS Survey. Participation in the CAPS database is voluntary, open to all users, and it's also an excellent way to obtain comparative data for assessing your performance. You can contact our technical assistance program if you're interested in participating, and please do subscribe to our mail listserv to be notified of database activities. That information will be provided at the end, so don't worry, we'll make sure you get it. Next slide. The CAPS database has a range of products to support users who submit data, as well as products for users who may not submit data. Users who do submit to the CAPS database <clears throat> will receive a private feedback report showing their sur survey results alongside averages for other de-identified submitters. We also prepare annual chart books with summary, summary level results representing all of those who submitted. These are available to the general public, not just those who participate in the database. Additionally, on the ARC Data Tools portal, you can have access to CAPS data that you can view or download. Finally, I would note that data are also available to support a wide range of research needs. Um, so if you are a researcher out there and have a particular uh, question in mind, data request forms are available on the CAPS website. You can submit a request for uh, de-identified data, and we try to support all users who are looking to use CAPS data to advance patient experience reporting and measurement. Next slide, please. Continuing along your CAPS journey, so you have your data, you've run your scores, now what? You can use your CAPS results to identify ways to improve patient experience. CAPS is designed to support a classic quality improvement cycle, which is what you see here on this screen. Looking at comparative data, or maybe even trends for your own scores over time, you can identify what's going well, what are the areas where you think improvement could be needed? How do the individual question level results help you to get a more nuanced understanding? And this is where we talked about uh, the importance of the composite reporting where you have multiple items that roll up together to assess something like communication. If you find your communication scores aren't what you would like them to be, it's time to dig into those and look at the individual item level scores to see where there may be room for improvement. Some users also choose to do a deeper dive to get a better understanding of what might be driving their CAP scores beyond the data that they may have from the survey itself. So perhaps a focus group or some interviews with patients themselves would help better understand the drivers and lead to identifying some new strategies or some new quality improvement approaches. With improvement strategies employed, it's time then to remeasure and see if you've moved the needle. What do your CAPS results suggest now? Next slide, please. For much more information than that very quick overview, I would encourage you to review the CAPS Ambulatory Care Improvement Guide, which is again, publicly available on, online. There are a ton of strategies in there that you can use to um, to see what may be working and how you may be able to advance uh, your patient experience within your practice or facility. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Karen Ginsberg from ARC to share some highlights from recent CAPS work. Karen? Thanks so much, Stephanie. Um, and uh, as Stephanie mentioned, I'm going to talk about some of our recent uh, work that we've accomplished over the past five years. We fund the CAPS cooperative agreements on a five-year cycle, and we just finished our fifth iteration of these five-year cycle. We call it CAPS 5. It just ended in the end of September, and we started on CAPS 6, the next iteration of funding in the beginning of October. So I thought this would be a really good idea to, uh, a good time to wrap up today with some of our accomplishments over the past five years. Um, there are more than I'm going to mention. These are just a sampling. Uh, and I think 
almost everything, if not everything I'm going to mention today is on our website, but if you can't find it or I'm mistaken somehow and it's not on there, just write to our technical assistance and we'll get you the um, email address at the end of the webcast today and we can help find it for you or send it to you or something. Uh, so on the next slide, I'm going to start just, I'm just going to go down some of our accomplishments. Uh, in the area of survey and item set development and revision, we spend a lot of time talking about um, telehealth over the past five years. We developed the CAPS Clinician and Group 4.0 beta survey, which is an ambulatory care survey based on the most recent visit. And what's really unique about this survey is um, is that it's, it's applicable to any synchronous visit that the patient has with the provider, whether it's in person or by phone or by video. And there are some drop-down questions uh, about the, the, um, the phone and the video visit uh, on that survey. We say it's beta because it hasn't been field tested or pilot tested yet. It's been cognitively tested. Um, you could use it for your internal quality improvement initiatives. If you use it, let us know what you think. We're, um, we hope to field test it at some point, but right now uh, it's still in, in this um, unfield tested form, but it's it's perfectly good to use for internal quality improvement purposes. And then we, we revised the wording of our CAPS clinician and group 3.0 uh, and health plan 5.0 surveys uh, and have a slightly new modification. Um, these are surveys that ask about experience with health plan or group or office visits in the last six months, and we made the wording more uh, amenable to being answered if you had a telehealth visit. We um, have uh, we completed a narrative item set, open-ended questions for our CAPS clinician and group survey. They're on the website, and we developed supplemental item sets for uh, on mental health care for the CAPS health plan survey and the CAPS clinician and group survey. As Stephanie mentioned, our new CAPS databases are the home and community-based services database, and that's in partnership with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and the Child Hospital Survey, uh, our Child HCAP Survey. I, I, I think I mentioned this on a previous webcast. We had to suspend the clinician and group database uh, where you just weren't getting uh, enough submissions to make the data useful. So. I, I know uh, people have asked about that in the past, and, and uh, that was a decision we had to make. On the next slide. So we uh, have developed a, uh, a Your Caps tool, which is a really great tool to help you embed your supplemental items uh, for uh, specific supplemental items for specific surveys uh, and, and place them in the right place in the um, uh, in the survey and uh, there's a link there. You can go and play around with that. It's for specific surveys and supplemental items. Uh, we've done a lot of work on some of our analytic techniques, including adjusting for differences in patient population characteristics when comparing CAP scores. Uh, we spent a lot of time on, not just on our survey methods research, which we always spend a lot of time on, but making it visible to you by putting a survey methods web uh, webpage uh, on our CAPS website for, for your use. We um, conduct a lot of research on the reliability and validity of CAPS surveys, uh, and also in, on enhancing response rates and representativeness of surveys, uh, including such um, factors as survey length and layout, mode of administration, or solicitation messages. The next slide. Uh, we uh, here are some highlights of our quality improvement research. We've uh, done work on shadow coaching to improve provider communication with patients in um, in an outpatient setting with our partner Ultimed, uh, using CAPS data to support transformation to patient-centered medical homes, patient narratives to inform improvement efforts for healthcare organizations, um, evaluating effective quality improvement strategies understanding the association of provider burnout with involvement in quality improvement, uh, and uh, a demonstration of creativity implementation paradox for patient experience and how it can be overcome. Next slide, please. Uh, this is my last slide. It, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's really important for us to get our, our work and our research out to you, our users. Uh, so, 
to do that. We've had four research meetings. Um, they, uh, their summaries, there should be summaries on the website, 20 webcasts, including today, uh, today's webcasts. We've made a number of enhancements to the CAPS website. We hope, and you'll see more in the future, and we hope it's easier for you to use. Our FAQs um, were revised, and I think they're much more helpful. We send out a number of um, gov delivery messages and uh, to, to keep people apprised of our activities. If, uh, and we'll give you some um, information about how to, to uh, subscribe to that listserv at the end of the, um, the webcast today. So that's about all I have. Thank you so much. And I'm going to turn this back to Dale, who will um, sum up and, uh, and lead the question and answer. Well, thank you very much, Karen, and also Stephanie for two very informative presentations, and they have inspired a lot of questions, uh, which we will get to now. And just as a reminder to ask a question, you use the Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom menu and type your question and, and send it in. We've got um, quite a few, and I hope we can get as far as possible. So let's, let's dive in. I'm going to Start with a few kind of more technical questions, Stephanie. I think you covered a lot of content, but let me ask you to begin with. Um, so with respect to the plan survey, the CAPS health plan survey for 2023, if, if a member is a new member to a health plan in this current year, do they get included in the sample or how long do they have to have been enrolled to be included in the health plan survey sample? Thanks, Dale. I think that may fall into a broad set of questions that um, were, <laughs> the answer will be pretty similar as we go through each one. Um, so because ARC does the research um, to put surveys and, and implementation information out there to users, but does not require implementation or have rigid guidelines for that. Um, some of that will depend on why you're administering your survey. So if you are administering the health plan survey for a requirement for uh, CMS, for example, then CMS will have guidelines about how to create your bookends in terms of patient population. Often there's a look back period for enrollment of six months, 12 months, um, it depends. So I would say um, you want to ensure that, particularly if you're using the health plan survey and it's got a six month look back period. Um, so for those of you not familiar with health plan, a lot of the questions are steeped in, in the last six months, how often did you know, this thing happen? Did your provider communicate clearly? Um, so you would want to ensure that, that your um, sample aligns with at least the look back period in the survey. And then beyond that, I would encourage you, um, if there are specific guidelines or you are required to uh, field the survey for another entity, for example, CMS, um, I would encourage you to check their specifications. They provide pretty clear and detailed specifications about um, how they need for those things to be administered. Okay, great. So that's a very great answer for kind of a complex question, which actually um, suggests maybe pivoting to a broader question, since you mentioned it sort of depends. There are a lot of things that just depend on the type of survey, but also the issue of what's required by whom. So Karen, let me pose this question to you because we've received quite a few questions even during the registration about requirements that come from CMS, for example, related to specific surveys like hospital camps or ED emergency department camps or home and community-based services camps. Could you just address a little bit the relationship between ARC and CMS with respect to collaboration and program requirements? Oh, that's a really good question. Thanks for the opportunity to answer that. Yes, I think a lot of times um, it's not really clear what ARC's role is vis-a-vis um, -vis CMS's role and other organizations' roles in, in um, in the CAPS program. And we work very closely with CMS and we, uh, and specifically we overlap um, on the trademarking of surveys, on survey, you know, the surveys that they use or want to modify. We are the agency that trademarks those surveys and assures their 
reliability and validity. Um, we produce um, research that can be used uh, by CMS or other organizations for administration or not, but we don't require the use of surveys for any kind of um, programmatic requirements. So CMS is a regulatory agency, the ability to require those surveys to be used to participate in their programs for payment or reporting or whatever. And they'll use the information that we produce or not as, as they need to. Uh, and we produce science that we share with them and we work collaboratively to understand each other's needs, but we cannot answer questions about CMS's um, programs. The best way to get that information is to um, write to uh, the, whoever the technical assistance provider is for the program that you're interested in. Okay. So there's, there's, we don't always have updated information on their plans or what they're, you know, where they are intending to take a program or, or what a requirement is, you know, or even how they would prefer to uh, administer a survey. And they do their own research on survey administration, risk adjusting for different kinds of modes of administration and that we don't do. So it's best to consult with them. Okay, great. Thanks for that very helpful reference to CMS. And I am going to come back to you now, Stephanie, um, with a few technical questions, which may also sort of be a depend <laughs> answer. To that. One relates to the number of surveys that are needed to be returned for results to be statistically significant. And I might add to that question sort of the issue of reliability for comparison purposes. You want to handle that one? I'll try. Um, this, again, unfortunately, is going to fall into the that depends. Um, so the first thing I would point to is there is information out um, on the CAPS website, the ARC CAPS website, um, that provides some of that information and provides some information around what we found in Typically, it had been field testing or other subsequent testing um, in terms of how many completed surveys do you need to obtain in order for this measure to be valid and reliable based on the analyses that we did um, during the development period. Um, that said, uh, there's always nuance. So there's no one single answer for all surveys or even one single answer for all of one type of CAP survey. One thing that comes up regularly that I would flag is um, if you have questions, and this is where maybe supplemental questions come in, where it's going to apply to a smaller subsample of those who you are fielding your survey to, you will need to field more surveys in order to get an adequate number of responses to those questions. So for example, if you take shared decision making, if not all of your patient population will have made a decision, some will skip out of that series of questions. And so you won't have any data for those. And so even if you have valid and reliable data, say for your communications composites, you may find that reporting your shared decision-making data is tricky because you have a smaller number of com completed responses for that. So um, depending on um, what you're adding in terms of supplemental questions, and how you're going to use your data, um, I encourage you to think that through and then whatever is the thing that you want most to be valid and reliable of your survey, make sure that you have at least a sufficient population that you anticipate will screen into those series of questions. And then do seek information from the uh, user documentation that's available on the CAPS website. It provides um, some kind of sample numbers that may help you to at least make an educated guess. Very good, thank you very much. There are a number of questions here that kind of relate to response rates and to modes. And there's like basically a half a dozen. I'm gonna to try to set this up so that you can answer. So in terms of um, electronic surveys, which you mentioned in your presentation, Stephanie, netting the lowest response rates, is there any new research about new modes whether they be mixed modes that we have evidence now that suggests a combination of modes may actually be the best, most effective way to increase response rates? Um, 
there is a lot that's changing and a lot that's changing actually really rapidly in the past short while um, with COVID. There's all kinds of people who uh, became much more familiar with electronic technology. Um, and so things are changing really quickly and we're continuing to do some research and see how that's netting out in terms of response rates. Um, but the other piece that we know, so in addition to things always changing over time and thing, the change being maybe more rapid recently, um, is everybody's looking for the most efficient and rapid data collection method. Um, and so far, we haven't found that electronic data collection alone is going to get a high response rate, and probably it's not also going to reach a representative population. Um, so for those reasons, we continue to encourage users to use electronic data collection as one mode within a multi-mode approach. So the other piece I would note is that depending on the, the, the communication structures that are in place within your organization, um, if you have really strong use of a patient portal, that may be a great way to reach your patient population. And if you don't, that's not going to work. Um, and so it really depends on what do you think is the best way to reach your population? Do you collect email addresses? If not, then you know you can maybe take that one off the table. And people will often start with whatever they think is the least expensive mode of data collection to begin, and then supplement that with additional data collection strategies to try to get to both a, a response rate that they're satisfied with, as well as a representative population. And I kind of keep coming back around to the representativeness because um, that's really important where response rates are continuing to decline. We're seeing that across all survey research. Um, it becomes especially important to make sure that the people who do respond represent your broad cross section of patients. Um, so for example, if you know you have a, a lot of Spanish preferring patients, it's really important that all of your methodology include Spanish materials. So a Spanish survey, um, a website that can, be, you know, that is Spanish, that you have telephone data collectors who speak Spanish. Um, and for the CAPS surveys, there are Spanish translations out there and available. Um, but it's a matter of, of additional resources to implement those. But if you do have a lot of Spanish preferring patients, that's kind of where the, the representativeness piece comes in, that to look at response rate alone is um, a little one sided. And so it's both the response rate and the representativeness. And unfortunately, the punchline is so far, we haven't found that electronic data collection alone is going to allow you to get to either a decent response rate or a representative population. But we're continuing to, to check it and continuing to make information available through things like these web, webcasts and as well as the ARC CAPS website. Right, and there's a lot of published literature on this uh, based you know, on the, the CAPS team's work. And a lot of that is on the CAPS uh, website. We'll give that information out at the end of the webcast so people can go there for additional information. I, I, I want to shift gears a little bit and, and get to one of the issues that I think has been such a important one that's been addressed this last year or so related to disparities. And I just want to ask you, Karen, you mentioned um, assessing racial and ethnic disparities in patient experience as an issue that is dealt with by the CAPS team and CAPS 5 the last five years. Can you say a little bit more about what that was and, and how that information can be made available? Yeah, it's available. Um, we had a recent research meeting uh, in September that specifically addressed this issue. It was called Assessing Patient Experience for Insights into Enhancing Equity in Healthcare. And we have research summaries on the uh, an agenda and session information on our website. Uh, and we have a number of uh, uh, questions that we asked um, we asked speakers to address and the audience to address. So that was held virtually. Uh, and um, we uh, were quite proud of that meeting. It, it attracted a, a national audience and had, had uh, national speakers as well as uh, uh, 
work specifically, researchers specifically focused on CAPS from ARC and also from CMS. So um, go ahead and, and look for that. Um, it's under, it, you'll get the information about the ARC CAPS website. And if you go and look for news and events and, uh, and you'll see it listed under CAPS research meetings. Again, if you have problems finding it, drop us a note and we'll just send you the link. Great. Stephanie, this is a question I'm going to get. I try to again combine because we have too many to actually get through here. Um, in general, you talked about the development of CAP surveys requiring input not only from multiple stakeholders, but patients themselves. So there's a general question about how are questions in CAP surveys updated to make them current? That's the general part. Then there's a very specific one related to content with the use of the word doctor. And is this an example of how CAPS survey content is modified or, or uh, enhanced over time to make sure that the reference that is being asked about in the survey um, is made more most clear to the respondent? Thanks, Dale. Um, let me start with the broad. Um, so all CAPS survey development um, has, has a very formal structure of the pieces that need to happen. And this applies to development as well as redevelopment. Um, so there are scans and reviews of information available, data, kind of what's already out there, input from stakeholders, and very importantly, from patients. And so then that's where we get to the domains or the big topic areas that align with patient experience and the things that patients think are important. Um, and then CAPS questions are, are made to address only those things that for which patients are the are best or only source of information. Um, so that's kind of how we get, and then we move into um, cognitive testing and then field testing and analysis for you know, validity and reliability. So that's kind of that piece, but we do know that things change over time in terms of how healthcare is delivered in terms of um, references to kind of the terms that the terms of art that people use to, to refer to things. And so we do ongoing testing of all kinds of things. So, you know, for example, what is the right term to reference the people that the patients interact with in the healthcare setting? Um, and so that, that ha has been one example that has changed over time of both who does deliver care, be it in a primary or specialty care situation or in a hospital, who's delivering which kinds of care. Um, so, you know, you may get some care from a physician, you may get some care from a nurse practitioner, you may get some care from somebody who's specialized in discharge planning for a hospital. So there's all these different individuals. And that's really important to know um, who is delivering which kinds of care, or what kinds of groups. Um, and then we need to crosswalk that with how do patients refer to that? How do they know it? How do they see it? And how do they refer to it? And so um, it's a really tricky balance to make sure that it's accurate clinically, but that it's also reflective of how patients, how it's going to cue patients to think about the group that is of interest. Mm -hmm. And so things like doctor, what does that mean to the patient? Not just who has that particular you know, training and education. Likewise, for things, terms like care team, um, you know, what does that mean to a patient and, and in what context? So we continue to revise and update terms of reference, as well as the concepts that are being measured. So um, kind of the advent of care coordination, um, that wasn't part of some of the original CAPS uh, domains. And that became increasingly important to figure out how do you measure that? Because that is clearly an important piece of um, what's happening in healthcare and what patients expect in order to get good quality healthcare. So we work, uh, so we get input all the time um, through our TA box and please do feel free to send us you know, thoughts or information or if you've fielded something and have some feedback, we're always interested to hear from users. Um, there are also periodic um, requests for information that go out more formally. So for example, with regard to the health plan survey, there was an RFI that went out 
um, a little bit back asking you know for you for feedback on possible updates to the health plan survey that information is all kind of pulled together as well as other input from stakeholders and users and then kind of we start down the process again of item development, cognitive testing, field testing. So it's an ongoing cycle where we try to ensure that um, the CAP surveys stay relevant and up-to-date with the language the patients use, the concepts that are most important to patients, and also the structures in which care is delivered and how that's changing over time. Okay. So this is an evolving enterprise with continual research and advancement of all of these methodologies. And I think that um, we'll continue to do that. I do wanna sort of, as we approach the top of the hour, um, ask you, Karen, about some of the directions in the future, but, but if I could just answer a couple of really quick questions related to the CAPS database that have been raised. First of all, yes, we do the CAPS health plan survey within the database, but only for Medicaid and CHIP populations at this point. There's extensive data available on multiple levels of scores, top box, middle box, bottom box. That is available um, through um, a request for research data or looking back through our collection of chart books. And one last point really quickly, the chart book that we just uh, pushed out this morning for the CAPS Health Plan Survey for the 2022 calendar year does show what has been a continuing upward trend in CAPS Health Plan Survey scores for Medicaid and CHIP had a little bit of a blip in this last year, which is an interesting development. And we are sort of speculating how that might be true. But now that we have just a few minutes left, Karen, there, much of questions came in about where is all this headed? We've alluded to that along the way, but can you comment a little bit about the future of CAPS work in, in CAPS 6? Sure, happy to do that. You know, we. Um... We recently, as I mentioned, uh, started the sixth iteration of our five-year funding for CAPS, and um, we generated a, a notice of funding opportunity with areas that we generally carved out, and then the those who wrote proposals um, or uh, decided areas that they wanted to. This is the the the, the way that the funding works uh, that they wanted to go into and develop, and then we. You know, award and so here's here's what fell out of that process. So we um, we will be working on maternity care surveys or supplemental items, both for uh, that will um, cover um, the prenatal setting as well as labor and delivery, and then go into some areas that we haven't really explored before, like birthing centers and look at issues of pain and you know. I, and I want to say all, there was a heavy emphasis on everything that uh, was proposed on achieving health equity. So that is the overlying theme to all of the work that's being done. So there'll be some work on maternity care surveys, inpatient mental health surveys, um, supplemental items on things like perceived bias, uh, communication with Spanish preferring patients, functional limitations. These are supplemental items that could customize a survey, um, work on the um, demographic items, the, the about you questions like the SOGI questions. Uh, there was um, re requested updates to health plan and clinician and group CAP surveys. So there'll be updates on those surveys. Uh, I don't have a date yet. I know people are anxiously waiting for that. Um, uh, and there's gonna be uh, continually work on maintaining the responsiveness and representativeness of surveys. And, and survey modes of administration that are preferred by uh, different population subgroups, uh, use work on use and reporting of narrative data mm -hmm. updates. Somebody asked about this and said they use the Ambulatory Care Quality Improvement Guide a lot. Yeah, we're gonna be updating that and thank you for telling us that you used it uh, and um, work on patient engagement, engagement differences by race and ethnicity. So that's just a high level overview. That's, that's where we're going. It's a lot, it's a big agenda. And uh, for all of you, next slide, please, as we wrap up, to stay in touch with all of that as we move forward, the best way to do that, or one of the best ways to do that is to get on the listserv for news alerts that come out of the CAPS program. The way to do that is to go to the CAPS uh, website, and then you find an icon that uh, is highlighted here. It says email update. 
you select it and then you can choose from a drop down uh, menu um, all the CAPS programs. And then you will be on a listserv and you will get uh, announcements related to upcoming webcasts, announcements about the CAPS databases, other resources that are made available along the way. Next slide. There are lots of ways other than that to stay in touch with us by email at um, this email address, chps one at WESTAT.com. Our toll-free phone line, which is 1-800-492-9261, and our website, which we've referred to a bunch of times, www.ahrq.gov forward slash CAHPS forward slash. I will remind you again that the event site that we refer to at the top of the, the webcast is available through next Wednesday, I think. Um, and where you can get the slides for today's webcast. When you go there, that URL is also embedded in the email registration that you all receive. The password to get to the site information is capitalized CAHPS 2022-2022. And last slide, when you exit, you will be um, pushed to a quick evaluation, which we really would appreciate you completing because it helps us understand what worked for you, what didn't, and ideas for future webcasts that might be of interest to you. So thank you again to Karen, to Stephanie, to all of you for your questions and your participation today. That's the end of our webcast and have a great rest of your day and a great 2023.